Hi guys. Um, thank you for having me here. Of course, thanking the sponsors first, uh, WGS as well for having us here. Uh, we did. A, I did a jam session uh, day one on edible art um, um, installations. Uh, for for those who have been to our establishment, um, I started it in two thousand and seven. So while waiting for Daniel, I'm just going to blabber on first and tell you a bit more about myself uh, while we set up. But so in 2007, um, you know, I started out 2 a.m. DZ bar, and at that time I was 24 years old, um, a little girl, I would say, you know, very, very ignorant, uh, very innocent, but I had a dream, and I wanted to share this with you today. I don't think I've ever done it in a talk before um, in front of an audience. Um, so at the age of 24, you know, I wanted to be to be someone. I wanted to, to pursue my dream. I wanted to, to take risk. And um, I did that, you know, and I, I basically went for my culinary training, which is what uh, you guys are doing right now as well. And after my culinary training, I'm like, okay, what else do I need? And they say I need a working experience. I found out, um, I started studying all the pastry chefs and the chefs as well, who inspired me. And so I went to travel, uh, backpack basically, took my backpack, um, my first travel was to New York. So I basically graduated from school, I uh, went straight to Paris to pursue my culinary education. Uh, for those in Singapore, it's great as well being here. And then after that, I told my mom, hey, I'm going to New York and uh, for seven days, but I basically kind of lied. And I did that for two over months or three months and I uh, took my backpack. Um, but I didn't take just my backpack, I took a luggage, so I kind of pretended that I didn't have a backpack. I put my backpack in my luggage, and when the seventh day came, you know, we were going to go home together, and um, in New York, what happened was when I arrived in New York, um, immediately I went to room for dessert. So the night time, I arrived, and I went straight to room for dessert. That was my first internship, and I told the chef, hey, I want to work for you for free for, for two, three months, however long it takes for me to learn. And so what I want to share is, you know, that first gesture, the first risk-taking uh, moment that I had uh, was that. And it kind of basically paid off because I didn't, um, I dared to ask. Although, you know, inside my heart I was like, you know, I was really scared. And um, I dared to ask him and I said, you know, here I am with two hands, two good hands, a willing heart. And I really want to work for you. And uh, I basically told myself I want to be a sponge. I want to learn as much as I can, uh, however long it takes, uh, however hard it is. I want to be a sponge and I want to learn this technique, I want to learn that technique, your philosophies, and continue to go around and ask. And I think uh, we, now we have times that are so different. Now we have so many interns at uh, the bar, which is really strange for me as well. But then again, you know. We always tell the interns, don't be afraid to ask, uh, keep asking questions, and that was actually what I did. Um, so what I want to share is also my first week at, uh, at Moon for Dessert. I mean, we'll go far, but I just spent, uh, two nights ago, I spent the entire night with him just talking and sharing, it was so good, because he was my mentor. And he made me just backpack, scrub the floors, and basically did the basic things, so I didn't even got to touch the food or the desserts. And I did that for an entire week. And I tell myself, you know, I traveled so far all the way to New York to learn from this chef, and there I am, you know, doing all the basic stuff. But then, you know, the, the, the key value is perseverance. One needs to persevere to, to continue your dream. You can't just immediately jump and go, hey, I want to be a hit chef uh, immediately. You got to start somewhere. And these values, like uh, Mr. Hugo was saying as well, humility, punctuality, all these values uh, count and it's super important as well and, and, and I had to learn it through through all my internships as well and um, I'm actually still surprised uh, that I'm standing here in front of you guys today to be speaking but the idea is constantly evolve your thoughts, learn and uh, even to this day we're constantly collaborating with other chefs and learning as well so it's actually my first collaboration with uh, Daniel doing this talk and uh, enough of me but I'll continue again later with my slides, and I'll let uh, Daniel introduce himself first. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you, Janice. It's, uh, it's an honor to share the stage with uh, somebody like Janice. Somebody that, you know, uh, looking at her work really sometimes inspires what I do as well. Um, it's 
very happy for me to be here today to look at all the students here. Um, maybe 18 years ago, I was same like a Shatek student, uh, just like one of you guys. Um, but I didn't have the opportunity uh, to, to sit down in a nice environment like this to hear uh, chefs from different countries, uh, different specialities to come here and give a talk. Um, but anyway, um, when I was when I was listening to what Janice just said, it was almost the same as when I was doing uh, my attachment, job attachment, uh, during my Shatek days. The first day at the pastry kitchen of uh, uh, when I was doing the attachment, I was given a green sponge. So what the uh, what am I doing with the green sponge? So the chef, uh, you know, he asked me to go into the walk-in chiller and you just shrug the walls, please. So I'm not, this, is this what I'm going to do um, for the rest of my life? Uh, scrubbing down walk-in chillers? Now I want to cook and I want to learn how to make pastries. That's what I'm here for. Um, but that taught me something. You have to uh, learn the basics first. And, and before you, you, you go on to learning something more difficult. And I mean, he didn't tell me what I was supposed to do scrubbing the thing, but after many years, I realized that hygiene is one thing that's very important. So I think it's for, for younger generations of chefs, it's important to ask, what are you doing? I was ready to give up after the first day of scrubbing the walk-in chiller for eight hours. Only one day, you give up? I mean, yeah, after one day, you know, I was just, ah, this is not what I want to do. You know, I, I'd rather be, you know, maybe working in a mall, aircon, you know, selling some, uh, I don't know, whatever I can sell, or maybe sell some cars or whatever. But then again, looking at the products that is going out in the kitchen every day, really gives me the kind of satisfaction of, you know, producing food. And the other thing I want to say also, because, uh, you know, today since you're talking about art in, in cuisine, uh, I was trained in a time where I had to turn carrots, to make carrots that look like olives. I don't know for what. Carrots should look like carrots. <laughs> right? So after when, when I had an opportunity to do my own cuisine, obviously as a cook, I had to follow what my chef told me, right? So I, after that, I, I told myself, you know, uh, what I do, uh, the food has to look like what they are. Carrots should not look like olives, or cucumbers should not look like dragons. You know, that's too much time wasted, but anyway. Uh, because Mother Nature has given us food that's come in different shapes, different sizes, uh, and, and different flavors, different textures, we should make use of that. Right? If you, like, you know, uh, there's one chef that used to say, Mother Nature is the greatest artist. And that should be true. So just follow whatever that's come naturally without changing anything. I think that know your food will look great. Okay, so you want to look at some slides? <laughs> so now I'll talk more about uh, my philosophy, my inspirations. I think one of the questions that I ask most of the time to us chefs is what, what inspires you? I mean if you see back the history in 2007 I opened up the dessert bar at the age of 24. As a very young woman, um, I mean how do you lead a team older than you when you have you know little experience and when you, you just have a dream. So the key thing is to have leadership qualities, of course, to first explain what your philosophy is. A chef's philosophy is very important. To find your style, to find um, you know, what you believe in. And when you're confident of what you believe in, everyone who works with you will find that confidence as well. Um, I brought in a new chef, I'm not sure if she's here, uh, Carmen. Uh, now, she's, now she's with us as well, hey. Yeah. So now she's uh, leading uh, the team at 2 a.m. And you know, the, the idea is to, the first thing when she arrived was I shared with her my philosophy. And I think that's very important. Um, you can have, you know, that many beautiful dishes, but if you have no philosophy and no idea to how to create, how can, you know, your chefs follow you? Then it will be very messy. 
you know, and so or they will be lost, and they will have no freedom to create. Um, in our space, we like to give people a lot of freedom, and they find their own space to create, but with that one similar philosophy. So I'm going to start. So I prepared some slides for you. Uh, if those of you are tweeting, I have a Twitter account too. So again, this is the bar. Uh, for those who have not been there, it's about a 45-seater bar. Uh, open concept. These are some of the dishes that I serve at the bar. Um, I'm very inspired by art on the plate, and that is philosophy in 2007 through to about 2010. And uh, ever since 2011, I start seeing food as art, which means when I started creating, it used to be art on the plate. But now, art is made of food. I know it's a bit complex, but um, you, might, you, might, you might understand me after I finish my slides. So that is what I used to do in, in 2007, you know, started creating all these. And uh, I think I have my book here as well. So in my book, uh, Perfection and Imperfection, which I launched uh, a year and a half ago, I decided to release all our signature recipes. Um, this is again something I would like to share with you, because in my career, where I used to work in 2005 with other chefs, in America and Europe, people share with me. Um, I had Alex Stupak, a WD-50 head pastry chef, as well as Alenius, head pastry chef, and he used to give me his recipe book. As a young kid, if I were to give you all my recipes right now, what would you feel? You would be like, really? You know, and, and, it, and, it, and it stayed with me. Because he said, you can take everything away from me. But what you can't take away from me is my creativity. So again, come and just join us and I gave her everything I had. I have. So, but the idea is, you know, we're creating together. So in the car while we're coming here, we're creating two new desserts, you know. And that's the idea, to keep sharing, because you never know what you're going to get back. And that's what I did. Um, he shared with me his recipes, and basically, it's a good recipe. But if I could develop more from that, you never find out. Uh, I mean, you never believe what you can create. So, going on, that's the garden dessert, uh, which garden dessert and savory dish, which we will do today, uh, based on his carrots and <laughs> his watermelon. So then, you know, I opened two AM dessert bar at the age of 24, and three years later, I decided. You know, I don't want to franchise the space. I want to have my own space for creativity. It could be in your own house, in your own kitchen. It could be anywhere, but just your own space to create. Create something that is unique for yourself. Create for yourself so that you are happy about it, so that you can create, you know, satisfaction and different experiences for your customers. And that's that's the thing. I mean, most of the things I create is for myself to eat as well, but also for my customers. So that's the lab space, and uh, that's our mission as well at the lab, to constantly develop new recipes. And believe it or not, we have a website at 2amlab.org, two, uh, two and under news, we share again all our recipes. It's kind of bizarre. Um, you know, we constantly spend so much time to develop a technique, a new technique, unique one, and yet we give away uh, the recipes. So if you want to check it out, you can, and be inspired by it. But what I want to really share today is to constantly give back because you really never know uh, what you're going to get back. So that's the lab mission. And um, I was inspired by a cave. So again, this slice has just meant to inspire you where you can find inspirations from. I was inspired by a cave and I started conceptualizing. These slides have never really been shown uh, before. I started conceptualizing how can I create an entrance of a space. Um, and this is the entrance of the lab, inspired by just a cave. And then we created this flavor wall with 1,000 flavors uh, that it housed in the lab. Uh, flavors are really important, flavors, textures. So I started developing a south flavor wall and a north flavor wall. Again, I want to share something else with you today that, uh, for example, carrot or even leather, paper uh, inspirations, inedibles and edibles. So at this wall, everything is edible. In another wall, everything is inedible. So you have paper, rock, stones, and uh, rubber. But you see the relation with fruit and inedibles and the forms? I mean, it's really interesting. Uh, for, for a piece of cloth, we could create something with this texture as well, even with, with this plastic, you know? And finding inspiration, it's really everywhere around us. You just really need to open your eyes and uh, look around you. So then that's the lab. And, uh, 
you would find this at the lab as well. And I spent quite a bit of time on this, uh, you know, sourcing out each ingredient and then also documenting them and so that you can um, also have a taste of uh, what is going on at the lab. So it's the soul of the lab and we share with you, for example, I go to the farm and pick out the Lindley and how to cook with the Lindley. So we're in the process of constantly putting up information for you and information is free. So that's the lab space which we will go, yeah. And that, that is the open kitchen concept of the lab. So and then now we're working on fermentation projects. So again, you know, constantly evolving and changing, um, changing what we we're, we're, we're doing. And we started doing collaborations. Like what I said earlier in my speech, you know, I'm still a sponge. I'm still learning. And uh, I started creating this concept of a guest chef residency program, very much like what we're doing here as well, to gather chefs to share again uh, what what is our philosophy. I mean, and next year I come back again, I think uh, it will also be different, you know, and that's the beauty of it, to constantly keep, uh, you know, being inspired and to share back. So I'm going to quickly do this, because I only have uh, probably two minutes left. Um, great, so that's also the concepts at the lab uh, dinners, dining experiences that we do in different months. The ones that we're doing for Woko May Summit this time around is also very different. Some of the dishes that we're doing at the lab. And uh, quickly share with you something that I've been working on, a very closed year project of mine. Um, you heard my story when I was 22 years old and 24 years old, and now I am turning 30 this year. Uh, ouch. But, <laughs> um, so basically what I'm working on right now is my edible art projects. Uh, I did a demonstration two days ago over here. And um, you know, taking food into bigger forms. So again, dreaming big. Again, dreaming bigger. I think the, the idea is to think out of the box all the time and uh, don't be afraid because this is what, how I started as well and six years later here I am and still constantly dreaming big and uh, challenging myself because I am basically running my own company. Um, I have no boss or no head so again you are, you are your mentor and you challenge yourself every day when I wake up I want to do something new, I want to inspire myself and how do I do that? It's a lot of uh, effort, but it will pay off uh, with hard work and also hours that you put in. So again, uh, put, I'm just going to run through this really quickly. These are some of the animal arts I do uh, with sugar and uh, also with uh, chocolate. You know, it's just really a lot of work, a lot of crazy hours. But you know, like what I want to show you this today is from a simple uh, plating to something so big. And really, don't be afraid to do this. Don't be afraid to think out of the box. Uh, I want to share this with you because I don't know, maybe someone in the crowd today will be inspired and you never know, maybe three years later you'll be doing something even more amazing than this. And I'll be very proud to have shared my five minutes with you to inspire you to do something even bigger. So that is a marshmallow ceiling. You know, I mean, maybe some of you have learned how to do marshmallows, but what if you did something big and long and uh, I'm, I'm not asking everyone to do sculptures but then I'm just sharing that thought process. So I'm just going to run this through really fast and uh, we're going to start a demonstration very soon so again we can uh, start preparing the demonstration. So that's some jelly shots uh, that we did and again interacting, people interacting with food. So these are some of the works that I do. Um, chocolate, chocolate sculptures, chocolate art, and people interacting with food. So, just now I said about my philosophy in 2007 as uh, art on a plate, and now for me, art is made of food. So, how my evolution, how my thought process has changed has really shaped me because of uh, nature, talking to people. And you never know when you find a spark of a moment in your, in your mind, um, you might just find that in yourself, your own philosophy, your own style. And uh, that's what I found uh, through my years. It doesn't just come in an instant. And no one can tell you this is your style. You gotta find it on your own. You gotta go out there and maybe it takes a month, maybe it takes 10 years. You know, and uh, basically you gotta find your own style and your own philosophy. So, if any questions so far before we start the uh, demonstration? <laughs> Are there any questions from the floor? I always have, oh there's a lady, hang on, there's one lady in the corner which I like to make. 
Yes. Okay. Coming to you. Hello. Yeah. Hi, it's me. Um, so actually, I got a question. Um, I know a lot of people who start up like their own businesses, and um, they're very protective of their recipes. You know, they're just afraid that you know the staff might take it and run it away with, run away with it. And um, I noticed that you mentioned that you've been sharing your recipes online and everything like that. So um, maybe you could share with us, like, I mean, your thought process about this. And um, I, I shared with you an example just now of uh, Alex Tupac, you know, sharing with his recipe book. Um, here I am in Singapore, and I find it also very challenging, of course, because uh, I, I personally want to learn dim sum, and it's very hard to get inside the dim sum kitchen and go, like, can you teach me? Because everybody's very protective over their recipes. Um, but then I'm like, why, why should I be like that, you know, and uh, I, I basically, if I keep everything to myself and uh, touch wood, if I go the next day, you know, then I kind of die with it. So I, I have that in my mind and, you know, it's, it's something that I'm like, no, you know, I, I want to share and it's okay. If, if there's a 3 a.m. dessert bar right beside me that does the exact same dessert, it's fine because, I mean, I, I have my own style. I have a soul in my, in my food, and uh, it can never be the same. It can never be exactly the same. Even if I give you our signature chocolate water recipes and uh, what have you, I mean, it, it will never, ever be the same. And uh, I think one of the lessons I learned, I did an exhibition, or rather a demonstration like this at the Sydney International Food Festival. So I was sharing with someone, I was, doing, I was starting to do uh, papers that are stretchable. Now I'm working on my sweets project and, uh, you know, so I want to make creative, creative uh, confectionaries. I started, you know, taking uh, edible, uh, or rather purees to dehydrate them and trying to make them stretchable. So I was sharing with somebody like, okay, instead of using sugar, I use uh, maybe fructose and I can make it slightly more stretchable. And someone in the crowd after the demonstration gave me um, a recipe or something, you know, and, and it was very touching. He slid it in my pocket and he's like, hey, why don't you try this? You know, so again, if you dare to share with someone your, you know, your, your doubts or something that you're trying to do and your goal that you want to achieve in a certain cuisine or a certain kind of uh, texture, you really never know. Someone in the crowd today may just tell me, oh, maybe you should try this, you know, or I'm going to work something with bamboo shoot today and uh, maybe you'll share with me. I've been doing that in my demonstrations in Taiwan as well with pineapple tarts. Uh, so on the last day, I started making Taiwanese pineapple tarts as a Singaporean, uh, of course, you know, and in front of all these Taiwanese, but I wasn't afraid because I wanted to learn from, my, from, from you guys. And so basically I did that and there was a head chef in the crowd who joined me on stage and we started making pineapple tarts together. And everyone just enjoyed the class. I think for me, food is about enjoyment, uh, it's about sharing, and I hope I answered your question. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to start the demonstration. Okay. Yeah, basically we're making a um, dessert, um, I keep saying dessert, savory, a savory and sweet dish. The idea is to share with you, um, that is a cuisine chef, I'm a pastry chef, how can we share a dish together? How can we uh, make it happen? How can we and put everything on one plate? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, okay. then we can take it away. Okay, um, Okay, I'm going to start with my components first. Um, I'm going to do some vegetables. I have some vegetables that are cooked in olive oil, uh, baby turnips, and baby carrots that actually looks like carrots. Um, um, I have also some um, caramelized uh, shallots, that's all like that, and I have watermelon. So there is, uh, on this plate there's, a different, there's different textures, there are different methods of cooking, um, different ways of hand, uh, handling the vegetables, um, keeping the, the original taste. So what I'm going to do is to caramelize this. Yeah. So we're going to bring it over here. So he's working with uh, watermelons and um, basically for, for dessert as well, we can make uh, you know so many textures of watermelon. So what we want to share with this dish is that sweet and savory, there's a very, very thin line, 
very blur actually between the sweet and savory components. I've also started working with vegetables and um, in my in my sweet desserts. So again, you know, just really finding the right balance of flavor and uh, texture in a dish. What you really want to create. If you want to make it more savory, then maybe you can add a little more salt element to it and lessen all the sugar components. If you want to make it a sweet dessert, then uh, it's just the level of sugar really good. So these days is really not uh, confined to pastry kitchen or cuisine kitchen. Say for example like this shallots. Uh, I'm using the same technique as what I learned to make caramelized apples in an uh, apple tart, say for example. So in this case, I've taken the apple out and put the shallots in. I've added a little bit more uh, vinegar. So it's, it's almost the same technique. So if you understand the technique, and then if you understand how it works, then I guess you know, all these components will basically work on the plate. Exactly. It's very interesting. I mean, I, I saw his onions, I tasted it. It was sweet and a little acidic. And I'm like, hey, I could actually use it for a dessert because we also have vinegar chocolate. I mean, uh, he did that with his onions. So we do that with our apples and pears. And uh, why not, you know, adding that bit of acidity and uh, also a pastry. Okay, so I've got here, um, yeah, it's uh, miso and brown butter, uh, sort of like a mayonnaise. Um, that's cooked egg. I've used uh, egg to sort of like make it, making a mayonnaise with brown butter instead of uh, vegetable oil. And I'm just going to put all the vegetables on here. This is basically compressed uh, watermelon. Yes. Well, what I see now is also colors. Uh, Daniel's really working with a lot of colors because it's springtime. Uh, we discuss about our dish together and uh, basically just taking the season right now from Japan. Um, it's spring season there and I, ha I have myself some of my spring elements like bamboo shoot, uh, ume. The colors are also very important in a dish. So visually it's appealing. Uh, what he's doing is all the savory components first, right? Yes. Awesome. So what some is that? Some that's asparagus. asparagus. Yeah, Which I so think I can change it into a sweet component, for sure. Um, just <laughs> some shaved uh, asparagus. So you shave it and you yes. launch it? Yes. So he's putting more of these asparagus inside. It's looking more like a salad right now. I mean, if you see it and you think about it, it's basically a salad. It looks like a starter or a salad yeah. right now. And then I have here is some dehydrated olives, uh, sesame seeds, uh, brown dehydrated brown uh, brown bread that's made to look like soil. So in a garden, basically, and, you know, you have, uh, you have the garden soil. So it looks like the um, vegetables are growing in the garden. Okay, so uh, awesome. that, that actually looks like one of our our sweet uh, pastries. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna put it right in the middle. And then it's my turn, how fun is this? I mean, you know, cooking again is about fun and now we wanna share with you, we share with you both our philosophies and approaches to ingredients and uh, our food. And now it's my turn to put the sweet element to it. So in the crowd today, you guys are gonna decide if it's more savory or more sweet, okay? So what I have here is to show you a vegetable. Uh, this is the bamboo shoot, it's been blanched. Uh, could you see it? Perfect. Great. So, something that I've discovered, because I was making a dinner in Japan and I was making my own teriyaki sauce out of uh, honey and uh, brown sugar and soy sauce. And basically I was making my own teriyaki sauce and I, had, I was cutting these uh, bamboo shoots in front of me. And um, I'm like, okay, maybe I could do something with the, uh, with the soy sauce and the bamboo shoot. And that, that was what I discovered actually. So, what I have here is I'm going to start just lightly dicing these uh, bamboo shoots. Okay. So, basically, just cutting it like little dices, okay? And just marinating them in soy sauce. But bear in mind, this is for our, our dessert actually at the bar. And I'm going to show you a photo right now of uh, actually a dessert that we have right now at the bar. So maybe we can see it on the screen in a bit. Okay, 
So this is the dessert that was launched last week at a 2 a.m. dessert bar. And right now the component that I'm, I'm dicing up and uh, working on is, is in the dessert. Now in the dessert there's actually a bamboo shoot uh, marinated in soy sauce and then sugared and uh, sugar and egg whites, which I'm going to show you the demonstration. And can you believe it? I mean, adding the element of vegetable but doesn't really taste like it. And uh, we've I prepared some samples and if anybody wants to taste this uh, bamboo shoot and soy sauce, you, you will be amazed. It tastes like a pesto. Now, uh, for pâte de fruits and pastels, uh, for those who know the uh, technique for that, uh, you eat the fruit roll-ups as well, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the fruit pastels. And basically they contain trimaline, they contain glucose, you know, lots of sugar. But here I'm basically taking a vegetable and making that into a texture of a pesto. And it's super amazing. It blew my mind off when I was uh, conceptualizing this uh, technique. Um, again, creating with no references. So, I'm going to continue. Okay. And uh, I have the soy sauce, and maybe I get Daniel to help me with the soy sauce. So what I have here is I'm just going to put in all the... Um, just marinating it inside my soy sauce. Um, just normal, light soy sauce. For those who want to try this at home. Okay. Or back in school. So just marinating it. And if you have a backpack machine, you can do this as well. So we prepared here as well, and you can actually taste it later. Um, for those who are going to come up and uh, or, or outside. And so what we have here is just doing this, and then after that, I dry it out. I get the pastels. And it becomes like this. So I dry it out in sugar. And uh, basically, it's like my snack right now. So it's super cool. Um, you would never believe this is from bamboo shoot. And again, you know, when, when we were conceptualizing this dish, I'm like, hey, you know, maybe I, I'm going to do something with a vegetable as a sweet component. So I'm going to eat this. I, I love to eat while I demonstrate, actually. I tried it. It was very good. So, now my turn to put a component on. Okay. What I have here is actually a miso caramel babwa, because he used miso in his brown butter. And again, you know, a babwa is a mousse-like texture. You take eggs and you whisk it up with uh, sugar and water. You boil it to 119 degrees and you make a pata bomb out of it. And you fold in mousse, uh, whipped cream. And basically, sorry, you fold in whipped cream to make a mousse-like texture and with gelatin. Now I added miso in it. So adding a little bit of salty element to this uh, miso, I mean to this uh, babwa, is possible. It's possible to add a little bit of the salty element to the sweetness of it. So who says sweet and salty doesn't go? I mean, it, it goes really well together. So I'm gonna slowly um, put this out. So I'm gonna leave this outside with me later and with Carmen. And maybe Carmen, you can um, yeah, you can let them taste this uh, miso caramel bubble. I'm gonna just gently put it here, a little bit of it. It's really awesome. Daniel, please taste. I got some of that, and uh, I'm gonna put some of the pastels on as well. And we have the popcorn powder. So I'm just gonna put about three or four of these. And then I have a bit of the popcorn powder. So it's just taking caramelized popcorn. Okay. And then uh, taking a uh, blender and just blending it up. So we have our popcorn powder. It sounds really bizarre with vegetables and miso caramel, but it works because you have the freshness from the watermelon, you know, the uh, saltiness from also the uh, olives, and then the sweetness that comes from the uh, popcorn to go with it. And you're going to garnish it with, uh, we're going to do the garnishing right now. He uses dill flowers, and I use dill flowers too in my desserts. Do you see the closeness in a relationship? Um, I think in the crowd we have cuisine and pastry here today. So this uh, 